Uh, pastor Elwood was actually South Point's worship pastor for almost eight years, and he is a good personal friend. And he graciously agreed to join us this morning to take part in a conversation about racial reconciliation. So we're going to Zoom him in in a meeting. So here's what I'd like you to do in the chat. Why don't we give him an applause? Maybe you can hit the heart button or put Pastor Elwood in the chat. Let's welcome him as I pull him up on a Zoom conversation uh, now for us to experience. Hey, I want to welcome to South Point Church today, Pastor Elwood Jones, not only my friend, but musician, an amazing human being. Uh, Pastor Elwood, it's great to see you today. Pastor Matt, it's good to see you during, during these times, man. It's, it's really, really good to see your face, man. I know that you're busy. Uh, you know, you have a family, uh, you have kids, you uh, run your own church and lead your own church in the midst of this season. I'm, I'm sure that you're busy. So on behalf of, of myself and South Point, I just want to say uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I really do, deep from my heart, really appreciate it. Um, I felt like it was really important, uh, Pastor Elwood, that as we kind of address and deal with uh, the things that we are seeing and facing um, in our current uh, culture right now, uh, that it would be appropriate uh, for me to talk to someone who has a totally different perspective that, if I was very honest, I, I can't have. Um, and so I would love to spend a few minutes just um, maybe asking you a couple questions and then sure. also wanting to give you freedom to look at you in the eye as my friend and go, hey, you have the freedom to, uh, yeah. to share honestly um, and vocally yeah. and passionately um, to, to yeah. our community here at South Point. And so I guess what I'm on my first question is really is um, as you look at the Bernaya Taylor, uh, you know, we see Ahmaud Aubrey, um, we see George Floyd. Um, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Um, wh what are you hearing in this in this very difficult season? Yeah, man. Well, I, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, so my feelings is all over the place, man, how I feel. My uh, my wife, she turns on CNN every now and then and Fox News. She's an equal opportunist. And uh, so she just got out of the hospital, but she's home. And the boys saw an incident where um, I think it was somebody got hit on the street. I think it was might have been a policeman. And it was traumatizing. And then, of course, before that, they saw the corona red thing. And that's scary. And, and the people running and all of this is scary. And so, you know, just from an internal standpoint, spiritually, if I could be honest, I'm very grieved. I mean, the, the emotions go from grieve to hurt, to confused, to I can't believe this is happening. This is surreal. Um, maybe I'll wake up tomorrow and this will be all over. And I just, it was just a bad, bad dream. Um, socially, I'm, I'm bewildered. Uh, emotionally, if I could be honest, I'm very hurt by um, uh, my Christian friends. Uh, who I, you know, thought was my friends. And, and of course, they're my, you know, I think, you know, I've had to condition myself in a way uh, for many of my white evangelical friends to, to lay a groundwork for them to be able to accept me. And, and uh, having done that, uh, maybe it's possible that I didn't show the, my, my true side. I mean, my true side is, you know, I care for all people, love all people, but I am an African-American, you know, and I have feelings. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm all over the place emotionally, you know? but, but I, I mean, just the question from you is just significant for me right now, just to, to be here and the, the potential for healing. Hey, if I could give a, I just thought about this right before uh, a little while ago, I was like, it just feels like, and not to make a, a point, but it's almost like there's a wound and I had salt right next to me. I'm in the kitchen and it's like salt being poured on a wound. Instead of being refreshed by water, I just feel like, man, I'm already hurt and banged up and denial about it. And then this new thing, just more salt on an, an open wound. So that if you want to know how I feel, that's how I feel. I'm sorry, Elwood. You know, I, I, I can't imagine what that's like. And as your friend, I, I just want to say that I'm sorry uh, that we find ourselves in, in the situation that we do. Um, I would like to ask you specifically, though, about justice and injustice. Uh, because as we look at these situations, at, at least from my perspective, for the first time in my life, I watched a man get murdered on a Facebook video. 
Um, and it and it broke, like I want to look you in the eye and go, it broke my heart. I, I can't imagine um, as an African-American man who not only is my friend, uh, but a pastor and who leads the church. Um, I would like you to give maybe a little bit of context and a little bit of like um, what you see happening. I mean, like I said, it's not just George Floyd. There was Ahmaud Aubrey. There was Breonna Taylor. I mean, these all happened within, yeah. I think, 30 to 90 days. Like, I mean... Uh, tragic, yeah. um, senseless, without due process, uh, yeah. almost without a point murder um, of yeah. people of color. And so would love for yeah. you, from your perspective, to speak a little bit to that injustice. And from your yeah. vantage point, what do you see? You know, um, I, I have to just kind of preface this by saying typically events. And well, it's funny, it's interesting that you saw that one incident uh of a, of a black man being murdered um, by a white policeman, but I've seen them over and over again. There are videos of that. There's a, I was talking to, we I have a great relationship with the police in Alexander, Virginia. We have great policemen, sheriffs here. Um, you know, I'm getting phone calls from my white brothers and pastors who are calling me and saying, hey, I'm with you. I'm standing in um, solidarity with you. And, and I, I'm grateful for that. But um, but, the, but to answer the question, I mean, I, um, the problem is, is that that is a reoccurring event. That's not a one-time isolated event. I mean, there, you just mentioned several of them, but there's hundreds and thousands of these events that have gone uh, without uh, due process. And so I think for the nation, because of the, the specifics of this event, that there was no real ambiguity, there's no question about what really happened now. There are people that will question it still. Did he really die by uh, a police being on his neck for nine minutes? That's some question about that. I'm not sure how you get that, but but the fact that we seen we saw that, and then we hear him crying for his mother. I I, I think that that shook a nation, you know, and uh, and so so anyway, just to answer, I, I, I'm not. I, I'm, I think I got lost on the actual question itself, but. I just think that when, when we look at it, even from a biblical standpoint, and this is where I, I have a, a huge struggle with, um, I, I expect the world to not have empathy. It, you know, but what I don't expect is Christ followers or whatever you call it, Christians, to not have empathy for anyone, and particularly in this case, a black man who was murdered on the streets by a policeman. I appreciate you sharing, on, honestly, Elwood. I just, uh, you know, I, I think what you said was was true in that, like, you have a great relationship with your local police force and that, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, poor policing or murder is not true of every police officer. And um, I appreciate right. your heart in that. Um, I, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, um, why do you think the church has been so ineffective at being leaders in, in racial reconciliation. I mean, I have my own ideas, but like, I'm, I don't, yeah. I haven't walked a mile in your shoes. And so I would love for you to maybe to be able to share, uh, what are some things that you see yeah. are causing the church to not be able to step into situations yeah. like this? Yeah. I, I, I want to share that in a quick story about South Point Church for those who don't know me, um, probably didn't know that I was, um, I was hired there and and some of the best times of ministry in my entire life. In fact, I feel very indebted to how we were able to launch our church and what God is doing there by your leadership, Matt, and then also my experience. Uh, one of the things that you helped me see was the difference between the terminology of a Christian and a Christ follower. I love the fact you, you're the first person that I heard the term Christ follower because I think that distinguished the difference. The, uh, a, a, a Christian uh, wants rights. A Christ follower relinquishes his rights. A Christian wants to save his life. A Christ follower would be willing to lose his life for others. I mean, I could go on and on on a preach on that one, but I think the biggest difference is we have bought in this country a lie. I mean, the, the first lie is that we are a, a a Christian nation. But But I think what happens is we have a very um, nationalistic type of a system here. We, you know, we, we buy into the fact that 
um, our founding fathers wrote this beautiful document that was handcrafted uh, through mankind uh, by God himself. And, and even in that document, it leaves my people out, right? So, so just the idea of that kind of, now we have some separation just in ideology. And to be very honest with you, um, I think a lot of people have not uh, really read the Bible in the context in which I believe it was written. I mean, in the same way in which God gave of his life through the person of Jesus Christ, we in the same way give of our life. Um, in the same way Jesus had to carry his cross, we also have to carry our cross. And that's not a, Christ, that's not a Christianity that we like because we're, 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 we're products, uh, communities of comfort. We don't like discomfort. And really, when you get into uh, this whole idea of what it looks like to be kingdom people, it's discomfort there. And so to the story, my first Sunday uh, I, uh, Pastor Matt, you didn't even know this story uh, because I was shielded you from the story. But I told my wife, no matter what goes on there, we're five percent of the people there, African Americans, and we're going to go there and love. We're going to build reconciliation. We're going to we're going to see that this fulfilled to the end. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Um, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so and so we went there in the first Sunday. Um, they rushed in and pulled me out mid-service and said, hey, I'm so sorry for what happened. I didn't even know what was going on. Long story made short, somebody called my son the N-word, the very first Sunday. And I'll never forget, not to be sad about that, but I remember smiling because I smiled. I understood that there's a price to pay for reconciliation, that I am willing to stand in here and fight for what I believe is a biblical mandate to love your neighbor as yourself and to build on that. I believe that we've been given the ministry gift of reconciliation. You and I have shared that together on, on stage, and that is both vertical and horizontal. So it's a mandate for me. It's a mandate from God. There's no ambiguity about what unity looks like in the kingdom of God. And so that means that we have to come out of, a, the problem is we have not come out of the ghettos of our cultural environment. Mm. I know that sounds a little hard, but it's just, it is what it is. <laughs> I, I appreciate your honesty. And, you know, I think I appreciate the fact, and when you and I were talking about this phone call and, you know, you shared that story for the first time, I, you know, I want to say thank you because I do think you and Betty uh, sacrificed a lot to move to St. Mary's. Uh, you knew my heart and our passion uh, at South Point to be a church that represents what we think the gospel's about. Um, and that came at a cost. I mean, a uh, cost of your family. The very first Sunday you're there, your son gets called the N-word. And I think uh, people assume that that still doesn't happen today. And I go, man, you should just talk to some people um, of color and have conversations. And so yeah. I just appreciate yeah. your honesty. Uh, one of maybe my last closing question, uh, Pastor Wood, and again, I want to say thanks for being here is, uh, yeah. what's, if you could maybe make one thing that you could share with your, uh, friends who are Christian and who are white, there's kind of one thing that you, you wish that they would hear from our time together today. Uh, yeah. what, what would, what would that be? Yeah, I, I would say the number one thing, and if I could just maybe take two, um, what you hear today, I, I would love it if you not receive any of this with any type of guilt or condemnation. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask in the front end, I wanted to ask, would you just open up your heart to just hear me right now? Not, not judge me by how I look or just really open up your heart, especially if you're a Christ follower, open up your heart to hear, to listen. And then secondly, I'm asking permission, would you, I want to ask, would you let me love you, but then also love me back? Right. Love me back. And then lastly, and, and this is not go with me per se, but what would it look like if instead of casting judgment and it, would you be willing to go over some political lines? <laughs> well, that's that's scary. Why would you ask anybody to do that uh, to really align yourself biblically with what God says as a true biblical narrative for how you should According to the Bible, live your life out. And so um, 
you know, I, I heard someone say, and I'll end with this. I heard someone say yesterday, and this may sound uh, hard, but th- this person said, hey, it, what would it look like if white people use their privilege? I, I know that sounds scary because it's like privilege. How did I get privilege? Well, you know, there's discussion for that. But use your privilege in a way that would make even a systemic difference in your community. And I would say, lastly, if I could just end with this, like, uh, just try to walk peaceably among your brother. Build, build relationships with people who don't look like you, don't act like you, may not vote like you. That's the true uh, value of love. And so, sorry, I, you had no, one. No, that's all right. Those, those were all good. Um, which is kind of maybe, I think, one of the questions that I do often get from um, my fellow friends who have the same skin color that I do, which is, what can I practically do? Um, you know, uh, the classic term I hear is, well, I, yeah. I have friends that are people of color. I don't feel like yeah. I have racist behavior. Like, I don't know how to be part of the solution. Right. Uh, what's one practical thing, Elwood, like you as a pastor, um, yeah. you as a as my friend, you as an African-American, what would be something practical that you would go, hey, if you walk away from this a message today, here's something practical that you can go and and do. Maybe one or two things. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, I want to say it again. I think have your heart in a position to say instead of me going to fix this, what if I just? It's what you're doing right now. You're listening. You're not. You, it, well, the beauty of this right now is that you have a lot of answers. You really do. But you're willing to reserve your answers for another time in order to hear first. And I think that's wisdom. So what does it look like if you if you listen? Um, and then uh, I would say try to find creases to not be able to e- even say, try to change someone or, hey, they need to know my side of it or anything like that. I mean, I think true love gives you an opportunity to love without conditions. And mm-hmm. so the first thing I would ask... Uh, if it's two things, one is um, to to not um, oh I, I lost it to to hear to listen and I mean I think that's the main thing to listen and then I would say you know lastly you know the, my heart for for the people who would listen to this is don't receive this as judgment don't receive this as condemnation don't please don't receive this as white people are bad and you know like like that's just not what it is I'll tell you this people of color do not get any benefit out of white people feeling guilt about privilege. We just don't, that's just not where we're at. We, what we do feel though, is a sense of healing when a white person comes along and they give us water. Not give us, but they'd be willing to refresh us. We don't, you don't need to give to us. We're saying refresh us in a time of need. And this is a time of need. Well, Pastor Elwood, uh, I just want to say thank you for joining us today, uh, <laughs> dropping some wisdom on us. I, I really appreciate it. Appreciate you, Betty, uh, Kayla, Kaylin, the boys, uh, Jamari and Michael. Just appreciate it. I know that, like you said, you you got 20 other million things you can be doing, and, and yet you took some time uh, to be with us today uh, to share and to speak from your heart. Um, and I've sensed a lot of grace from you. Thank you for being a champion of reconciliation. Diversity and reconciliation. Thank you for that. And thank you for stepping into justice. I appreciate it, my friend. Yeah. All right, Elwood. Will you be blessed, my friend? And have a great one, okay? See ya. All See ya. right. Bless you. Love you. Aww. South Point. Love you, South Point.